Well, this week, journalists from around the world have debated the changing nature of the industry and what that means for democracy at the first public knowledge forum. Jay Rosen is a professor of journalism at New York University. He was a guest at the forum organized by the U.S. Study Center, and he joins us now in the studio. Thank you very much for coming in. Thanks for having me. First of all, I'm going to put you straight in it. What's your view of 24-hour news channels that are run by public broadcasters? Well, when there's 24 hours of news, you don't have to remember when the news is on. You <laughs> catch it when you can. And that's actually symbolic of something that's happening in the news world, which is uh, on-demand news, uh, where you want it, where you are. Uh, as opposed to having to accommodate the news industry. There's a lot of discussion about losing investigative journalism as uh, people lose jobs and as profits drop. Um, some people would say that 24-hour news could be regarded as journalism. Is there a place for all kinds of journalism in the new world? Well, we want to know what's happening uh, when we have time to check in. And so news is 24 hours, social media is 24 hours. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's not either or. No. We, we also have to recognize that um, longer term stories and digging under the surface of things is something that you can't do in a bulletin. Indeed. Well, you've been discussing the distinction between Old Testament journalism and New Testament journalism. Can you explain that idea in a nutshell? Sure. In the, in the United States, when political journalism began in the 18th century, uh, political argument and what's happening were the same thing. You found out about the news by also hearing someone's opinion about what should be done. And that was the way political journalism was for a long time until the 20th century. And the idea of separating facts from values arose, and that's the... Uh, imperative to be impartial that has been so important for the BBC and the ABC. Uh, and so I call that New Testament journalism because it's actually newer than what we started with. And today we see the older forms of more opinionated commentary mixed with news coming back to a kind of parody with uh, New Testament journalism, as I call it. So it's kind of like, I suppose, crusading journalism perhaps versus masquerading journalism? <laughs> well, there is something deceptive about we don't have any views, we don't have any stake, we don't have any interest, um, we're just telling you the news. Um, there, there, there is something that, that people, I think, would mistrust a little bit about that. Um, and crusading journalism has its limits as well. I think we're better off with an ecosystem in which both have their place. Why is opinion currently so popular? I guess it's, it must be the same in the U.S. It's popular here even though people say they want the facts. Mm -hmm. They really want other people's opinions, don't they? Well, opinion is one term for it. and Another term is people like to get into arguments. When they get into arguments, that causes them to look for information. And what's great about that kind of journalism is that it's engaging. It involves people in politics in a way that simply presenting facts and issues or the wheelings and dealings of the insiders may not. But does it inform them? I mean, I think you've used the example of, of climate change. We have a great debate about climate change in this country, but do we really know what the facts are? I don't think anyone has solved the problem of how do you inform people about climate change. <laughs> I think it's like a a busted system. We just haven't done a good job here or in Australia. Um, and there's a lot of heat and less light about it. But because it's in the future and it's, you know, something that oozes rather than explodes, um, it's just a very difficult issue to engage people with. People have asked me to ask you about Australian journalists. A couple of years ago, I think it was, you wrote some opinion pieces about how political coverage in this country is broken. What mm. are your views on that now? Well, what's different about Australian journalism is that you have sort of three empires. You have the Fairfax Empire, the Murdoch Empire, and then the ABC, and that accounts for a lot of the press here. Um, 
and that's very different than, than, than the United States. I do think among the people whose job it is to report on politics in Australia, that the cult of the insider is still very strong. And focusing on the maneuverings of the political class is perhaps one thing political journalists should do. But to take their cues from that, I think, is still a problem. Now, since I was here the last time, there has been some opening up and some changes I understand. And I don't present myself as an expert on Australian political coverage. But there is a kind of seduction to the notion of the insiders that I think the political press here could be a little more wary of. So who or what is perpetrating that notion of a political journalist as an insider? I think it's the demands of professionalism itself. I, th I think it's the desire to be part of the professional political class or at least to be um, a knowledgeable uh, source of information about it. Um, and the people who work in politics and see the public through uh, the lens of the operative, the people who study it through polls, the people who report on it share some common assumptions, and that's what creates the cult of the insider. Before I let you go, as the effects of um, Edward Snowden's NSA revelations start to filter down, mm. is this a debate that our viewers and listeners are tuned into, or does it only matter to the political class, journalists, lawyers? Well, I think pervasive surveillance matters when you understand what it is. When you really understand that everything that you communicate electronically could be stored and captured by the government, um, I don't think that's something that only the political class should be worried about. Um, however, the ins and outs of the security state um, probably don't concern the average person all that much. Uh, but um, when, you, when you look at what their surveillance state is actually doing, um, it's not a story just for bureaucrats and for, and for journalists. It's, it's about everyone's privacy and it's also about freedom in the sense that we don't really speak freely and think freely if we think we're being watched. And I think that's the deeper part of that story. There's a lot of talk about where newspapers are heading at the moment. Mm. Is there a new business model for a, a shrinking business model of a newspaper? I don't think there's going to be one business model that replaces the one that the internet broke. Um, most likely what we'll see is these organizations, if they find sustainability, will do so by developing a number of new revenue streams to replace the old one of advertising and subscriptions. And that'll include events, it'll include um, subscriptions of a uh, digital kind, um, and perhaps other ways of making money that aren't even being tried yet. So it's going to be a long period of experimentation, trial and error ahead for, for newspapers. Jay Rosen, thank you so much for coming in and joining us. Thank you so much for having me.